Father, we pray as we look at the doctrine of the church that you would help us to understand it and that it would be practical in the way we think about what we do in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, there is a brilliant book on the church that I thoroughly recommend. It's called Cinderella with Amnesia. It's by Michael Griffiths. Now, you can get it on Amazon for $300, but you can get it second-hand for $5 or $10 or whatever. Uh, it's an end of asking press book, which means that after five years, they take it uh, out of circulation and replace it with something that's only half as good as the cells and make some money, and it's all about money. I've argued with them for hours on the phone from here to England. Cinderella with Amnesia is, is about sort of uh, discussing the relevance of the church, and the idea is the church has lost its way. And uh, Michael Griffiths uh, is not an academic. He's a popular writer, uh, the general director of the Overseas Missionary Fellowship, in fact, um, and brilliant. So I thoroughly recommend it, but as I say, you've got to get it second hand, or fork up a lot of money for the one or two copies still left here. All right. When we talk about the church, oops, if you turn it on, uh, when we talk about the church, that's normally what we think of. Uh, Westminster Abbey, rural churches. Um, that's a church in Scotland that we used to own back in the 16th century. Uh, and, of course, that one you recognise. That ain't the church. That's the church building. So let's look at a passage of scripture to set ourselves up. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, who are also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, Paul is writing there about the Gentiles and he's saying you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people. So in the church there are no divisions. Jew, Gentile, uh, male, female, black, white and so on. It's a place where all of God's people come together. Members of God's household, the church is God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus as the cornerstone. Now, um, in the ancient world, when you built something, the cornerstone had to be exactly square because it went down and then the building radiated out from that. And in 1 Peter, uh, he also uses the capstone. What happened at the end was the capstone held the whole thing together. Uh, so Jesus is the cornerstone on which everything else is built. If it's not built on Jesus, it's hopeless. A holy temple and a holy dwelling. Now the doctrine of the church is important. The reason for the antagonism between Newcastle Diocese and Sydney Diocese is not because Sydney's evangelical and Newcastle's high church, it's the doctrine of the church. Because the Sydney doctrine of the church is exactly the opposite of the Newcastle diocese doctrine of the church. The Sydney doctrine of the church is biblical, the Newcastle doctrine is based on how the church developed through history. And the sticking point is the role of the bishop. In Newcastle, the bishop is important, in Sydney, the bishop is a servant, as we'll see in a moment. Now, there are two words. The first is uh, kyriakos, and that means a building with uh, the right adjective. It's the Lord's building. It never occurs in the New Testament. All right, so it is never called a building in the New Testament. The second word is ecclesia. And that means a congregation or an assembly. And that's the only word the New Testament uses. And it uses it always 
for a local congregation. Now, in before the New Testament, in the Greek world, um, it just meant an assembly of people in a town. They all had equal rights. It came to mean any properly convened assembly of citizens. And in the Old Testament, it's just an assembly of God's people. And there are a whole lot of verses there that you can look up in your own time. A body of people who are summoned for a meeting. In the New Testament, the same things apply to the word, it's not people choosing to meet together. It's as people assembling because God has called them to himself. So I don't come to church because I want to, I come to God to church because God has called me to come to church. All right, now, um, so, assembly because God has called them to, not to share their opinions, but to listen to God. The New Testament had no buildings. Let's look at the New Testament church. The first thing, it was localised. It met in various places. There was no centralised organisation. There were no buildings. They met in houses and halls. In houses, first of all, and then when they got too numerous, they would meet in a public hall, but they had no building. They had no centralised organisation. And the leadership patterns were developing through the New Testament. Uh, even Paul as an apostle never said, you must do this. He always said, uh, you know, if you love me, you'll do this. I don't have, uh, I could tell you to do this, but I won't, I'll simply ask you to do it, that sort of thing. There is no liturgy mentioned. They would have used uh, carryovers from the, from the Greek, from the Jewish services. Um, and they had the Lord's Supper and baptism. That's all we know about the New Testament church. So, what is the church? Well, there are all sorts of possibilities. Uh, before we get to that, as the church developed. First thing is it had buildings. Uh, now, buildings are a real pain, but they're necessary. Uh, when, I was, when I went to Mount Druid as a curate when I was first ordained, uh, the rector's kids used to say, uh, you know, Church used to be in the house. And so every Saturday night you had to move all the furniture out, clean the floor, bring all the chairs in. And then on Sunday night you had to move all the chairs out, bring the furniture back, sweep the floor, all that sort of thing. And it was a real pain. And uh, so there's a lot to be said for house churches, but they do have problems. And that's why we have buildings. <coughs> There was leadership developed because any group of people automatically throws up a leader. I mean, psychologists have all these things. You put a group of people together, somebody will turn out to be the leader. It just happens automatically. And so what happened was that the leadership pattern uh, began to develop. The organisation of the church then began to develop. So you got used to doing things in a certain way and all that sort of thing. And then there was centralisation. So the Roman Empire, everything was centred on Rome. If that happens in public life, then why not for the church? So you start to get centralisation. Now, none of those things have apostolic authority. Nothing must contradict the principles of the New Testament. But as we've seen, they are really very vague and very broad. None of those things have apostolic authority. Therefore, there is no one way to do church. We're not right, and everybody else is wrong. That's the bottom line. So what is the church? People talk about it. You know, the Anglican church, there ain't no such thing, really. The Anglican church of Australia, nah. The Anglican church of Newcastle Dice, nah. The Anglican church of Wyoming, yes. That's the New Testament church. It's the local congregation. All of those other things we call the church because they are things within which we are, within which we are, with, we're in fellowship with them. Yeah. 
sorry, grammar's all over the place. So we're in fellowship with the other local churches. We're in fellowship with the churches of the diocese. We're in fellowship with the worldwide Anglican communion. We're in fellowship with the worldwide church. But we, here at St. James Wyatt, are the church. We are where God calls his people together. Everything else is designed because it can be helpful to us. But as I understand the New Testament, it has no authority on us. We are what matters. So, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Relates initially to the local congregation. But as time progressed, of course, it spreads out. And so you have the universal church. So we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, which means the Holy Universal Church. It's made up of a whole lot of local congregations who are in fellowship with one another. One body, one spirit, one heart. So the universal church is not a New Testament concept. It's something that develops as the church develops. And the more you move beyond the local congregation, the more problems you get. Right? So you get denominations, horrible things. Uh, you know, can't have anything to do with it. We had like, dinner last Wednesday night here with, with the Catholics, and it was a lovely night. But when I was a teenager in Wollongong, we had a lane at the back of our place, and on the other side of the lane, a little bit higher than our place, lived a blonde, same age as me, who went to a Catholic school. To this day, I've never spoken to her, because she wasn't allowed to talk to Catholics. You know, that's, that's the way it was. Well, denominations are a real problem. Diocese and politics are a problem. Uh, you know, synods get together and they uh, have voting tickets and all that sort of thing, um, which I've been part of in the past. And national issues come in. So the national church is different in various countries. Uh, the American church is always different for everybody else. <coughs> so the wider you get from the local congregation, the more problems you have. Now on another level, the church is a worshipping community. <laughs> And it's a worshipping community permanently gathered in the heavenly Jerusalem. That's the real church. Jerusalem that is above is free. She is our mother. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. And so on. So the church is the worshipping community permanently gathered in the heavenly Jerusalem. So theologians therefore talk about the church triumphant and the church militant. The church triumphant is the church in heaven, of which we are part, though we won't fully be part of it until we get there. But the church triumphant includes us. So we'll meet those who have gone before and be one with them. Now, uh, John will contradict this in his lecture, but that's all right. <laughs> when I get to hell, I never got to meet my heroes, Thomas Cranmer, John Knox, George Whitfield, J.C. Robb. I'm looking forward to sitting down with them as, as an equal and, and discussing the theology. Uh, that's all right. John, John will tell you that's not going to happen. That's fine. <laughs> um, the church... But I'm part of that, you see, I'm there, I'm, I'm already part of it with all of those people who are my heroes. The church militant is the church here on earth engaged in a battle with Satan and his followers. So it's like a mighty army. That's why we need to work together. Uh, because if we don't work together, we've got problems. 
the Roman army was the greatest army in the world, not because it had the best equipment, but because it was the best trained. They worked together as a unit. And when they stopped working together as a unit, because they started to get soft, that's when the Roman Empire fell. Now, I've said the New Testament tells us very little. And I've covered it when you'll go home now. But of course, what's happened in history is that the church has developed, and the church to which we belong, the local church, and the churches with, within which we're in fellowship. I keep getting that wrong. Anyway. Um, it's, it's developed historically. And so what I want to do now is not deal with the Bible, because we've already covered everything there, I want to look at the 39 Articles of the Church of England, which are the, the statement that they're not, they're not, I don't think they're the best statement, I think the Westminster Confession is better, that's the uh, Presbyterian Church of Scotland Confession, written by Englishmen of course, but that's another story. Um, I think it's better, but the 39 Articles, they, they are confessions that were hammered out in the heat of the Reformation when issues were really red hot. And so they're the, they're the 39 articles are the basis of our Anglicanism. So our constitution says that uh, the basis of our church, the basis of our faith, is um, the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 articles. They're the things that make us Anglican. So let's have a look at a couple of them. The visible church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men. Now you've got to substitute people or whatever. This is the 16th century. It was not a woke century, nor was the 17th, the 18th, the 19th, nor the 20th until the last 10 or 15 years. But anyway, that's another story. A congregation of faithful men in the which the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments be duly ministered according to Christ's ordinance in all those things that of necessity are requisite for the same. Now the first thing is the visible church. Again, theologians talk about the invisible and the invisible and the invisible. The visible and the invisible church. Sorry about that. Uh, you can correct that in the notes. Um, the invisible church is the true church. Only God knows who's in it. The visible church is the church as we see it. And it contains all sorts of people who aren't part of the true church. So, Matthew, uh, Jesus says in Matthew, watch out for false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And so it goes on. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And the answer, of course, is, yeah, they will say that. But they're not telling the truth. Because the church is made up, the visible church is made up of those who really don't belong. So there's the parable of the, uh, of the wheat and the weeds, according to the uh, New International Version. Um, if you read the authorised version, it's the wheat and the tares, and that makes a lot more sense. Tares are a weed that actually, as they're growing, look exactly like wheat. And so that's the point. Uh, you can't pull them up while they're growing because you can't tell the difference. It's only at the end when you come to the harvest that by that stage they start to look different. And so that's the reason the church is full of all these people that shouldn't be here, because they're not going to be weeded out on the way through, because you can't tell the difference. You know, they walk around with their Bibles and they, they sing the hymns and they say the right things, so they're fine. It's not for us to judge, not for us to say, oh, you don't belong. Uh, but we need to be aware that the visible church is a church that has all sorts of fire. So there's a lot of other references in the New Testament. John 1, John 2, they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. 
If they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So in other words, they never really belonged. And then Jude, we just done a series on it, so I picked two verses. Uh, for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago and secretly slipped in among you, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So in the name of uh, Christianity, they teach things that are contrary to the teaching of Jesus. And they teach a morality that, that is contrary to New Testament morality. And then the second one, I just put that in because I love the description of them. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted twice dead, and wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Just, I love that. I just put that in because I like it. Okay, so you get the point. The visible church has all sorts of people in it that are not in the invisible church, the true church, the church triumphant. Now what does that article say constitutes the church? It's a place where the pure word of God is preached and the sacraments are administered. Okay, so I can think of a lot of churches that aren't the church because the pure word of God is not preached. Sunday by Sunday. Uh, the sacraments are usually administered in the Anglican Church, over-administered in fact, but that's another story in on that numerous times. So they the two things the article says make up the church. The pure word of God is preached, the sacraments are administered. Um, when you read about that in this diocese, you just get the word and the sacraments. The, church, the Anglican Church is the church of the word and the sacraments. But what is meant by the word, I don't think necessarily means the pure word, which is what the article says. So what's the purpose of the church? In him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's a place where God dwells in you and in your brothers and sisters in the local congregation. Well, I am less than the least of all the Lord's people. This grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, he talks about preaching, which um, I'll come back to in a minute, I think, I hope so. Um, preaching about God and Jesus. So that the people in the church will, be, will get wisdom and in wisdom, no witness to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms as well as people down here. You also are like living stones that are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. What is then the purpose of the church? The visible church should be a company of the redeemed who meet for common worship and mutual edification and a centre of witness to preserve and propagate the gospel. Now look at those things, a company of the redeemed. So the church is primarily for those who are redeemed. Uh, a lot of churches, well, no, not more, some churches, um, do everything to try and attract outsiders. Um, have services that are designed to attract outsiders. 
The church's first responsibility is to the redeemed. Now, we will do things to attract outsiders, but the whole point is uh, it's there for the redeemed. If the redeemed don't feel comfortable, then the church is not doing its job. We meet for common worship and mutual edification. We learn. Um, I'll talk about preaching here. I forget whether it comes up later. Preaching is not, according to educators, the best way to communicate to us. But preaching is God's way. Preaching, the authoritative proclamation of the Word of God, is what God uses to change hearts, to transform lives. And historically, every age when the church has been weak and in trouble, has been an age of poor preaching. And every age in which the church has been strong and vital has been an age when there have been great preachers and great preaching, not just in the main pulpit, but throughout the land. Because preaching is what God has ordained to help us to learn and to respond to him. Again, there's a brilliant book on that by Brian Edwards called Shall We Dance, in which he attacks uh, a lot of modern worship and says none of these things must ever take away from the centrality of the church. Um, I love the, the Presbyterian Church, Church of Scotland, because you have <coughs> right at the front, up in the centre, yeah. the pulpit, and underneath it you have the table. We have the table and the pulpit's off to the side. They get it right. The pulpit is central. Um, and then I don't know we did that way. We actually got a pulpit made in honour of an old guy who was a very really important part of the church. And I said, let's honour him before he dies. And so we got this beautiful wept and made. And I stuck it bang in the centre of, of the church with everything else behind it. And uh, I said, that's because this is what we're on. And then, of course, everybody sat down in the back, so I picked it up and walked down the street. From <laughs> they all came up the front after that. Um, so, now, in carrying out its purpose, the church should not venture beyond the gospel. That's the thing, and that's very important. So, the last issue of Encounter magazine, which is the magazine of the diocese, which is on the internet, um, the articles are about reconciliation with First Nations people, the voice, climate change, other ecological issues, same-sex marriage blessing, and domestic violence. It's not the role of the church. Right. Individual Christians are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. So if you feel strongly about any of those things, go and get involved. But it's not the role of the church. And we learned that, remember the festival of light, um, which was a moral campaign. Very successful in England, not all that successful in Australia. In England, the churches were not the people who instigated it. Christians were involved, but it was not a church movement. In Australia, it was basically a church movement. And it's not what the church is all about. The only one of those things that could even remotely be the church's responsibility is domestic violence, because I think the Bible says enough that we can make some claims about that. But on reconciliation, the voice, climate change, ecological issues, no. Same-sex marriage, definitely no, because the Bible says exactly the opposite. So you see, we have to be very careful. And the, the problem with it is, once we start making noises about this, if we're, we divide people, right? So when the bishop makes a huge amount of noise about we've got to say yes to the voice, well, that means that 60, whatever, 70 percent of the population are offside on an issue that is not gospel. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get involved in that sort of thing as a church. You do it as an individual Christian. And that's your responsibility as an individual Christian. But it's not the responsibility of the church. 
Let's move to a more general view of the church, not the one, not the biblical one, but the way we think today. Article 20. The power has the church has power to decree rites or ceremonies and authority in controversies of faith. Yet it is not lawful for the church to ordain anything contrary to God's word written. Neither may it so expound one place of scripture that it be repugnant to another. Wherefore, although the church be a witness and a keeper of holy writ, yet as it ought not to decree anything against the same, so besides the same, ought it not to enforce anything to be believed for the necessity of salvation. That's a great thing to live in the 16th century, eh? <laughs> but if you lived in the 16th century, you would have understood that. Let's have a look at it. The church has the power to decree rites and ceremonies. So the prayer book, produced by the church, and when the church says you have to use it, the bishop says we have to use it once a Sunday at least, um, there, is, there are good points about that because um, it is biblical and all of that sort of thing, but that's, that's another story. Um, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So everything is related to Jesus. So rites and ceremonies, controversy of faith, um, the Bible says what's right. But in the modern world, there are all sorts of controversies that aren't really clearly covered in the Bible. And so the church sets up uh, authorities to do that. So the Anglican Church of Australia has a panel of people, with theologians and lawyers and so on, who make um, statements about such things. We'll come back to them in a minute. But the guidelines are very clear. Nothing must be contrary to God's written word. So when the church says we should bless same-sex marriages, that's contrary to God's written word. And so you can't do it. Except I'll explain why in a little while it happens. Not one piece of scripture should be repugnant to another. In other words, you interpret scripture by scripture. You don't go out and say, well, this is the only verse that relates to... Um, to purgatory, but purgatory is our doctrine, so that's it. You can't have other verses relating to it. It's not real. And you're not to enforce anything that is not necessary for salvation. So the church can make all sorts of laws, but it really can't enforce anything not necessary for salvation. And what's necessary for salvation? Faith in Jesus. Full stop. So our way of Doing things in church is not the only way, or even necessarily the best way. We come here because we think it is, I assume, but it's not necessarily. And it doesn't mean that Presbyterians and Baptists and, and all of those aren't going to get to heaven because they don't use the prayer book. No, nah, it doesn't mean that at all. General councils may not be gathered together without the commandment and will of princes, and when they be gathered together for as much as they be an assembly of men, whereof all be not governed with the spirit of word of God, they may err and sometimes have erred even in things pertaining unto God. Wherefore things ordained by them as necessary to salvation by the strength nor authority, unless it may be declared that they be taken out of Holy Spirit. Okay, the historical situation is you have the great councils of the church out of which we got the creeds, the, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and so on. Wonderful, we still use them. But you have a lot of other councils that decree all sorts of things that are not so good. Because councils are made up of people who are not governed by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and so they err. So in our modern world, we have councils and synods. We have general councils, which created the creeds, we have councils now, like the Primates Conference, uh, which meets every 10 years. Um, the World Council of Churches, which is where um, left-wingers from, from all different churches get together to, to do what the United Nations does, abominate, anyway, no, synods. 
And we have in Australia, we have the General Synod, the whole church in Australia, and the Provincial Synod, the church in New South Wales, and we have the Newcastle Diocesan Synod. Now let's look at our situation. The General Councils, the creeds, well, our 39 articles tell us the creeds are to be believed, so that's fine. The Primates Conference, we don't have to pay one iota of interest in that. Um, doesn't matter what they decide, it doesn't have any effect on us. The Archbishop of Canterbury has no status in our, in our church here. Indeed, GAFCON, which is the alternative to the Primate Conference, uh, which is made up of the uh, um, confessing Anglicans, that is Anglicans who believe in the Bible, they actually, at their conference, before the Primate Conference, call on the Archbishop of Canterbury to repent because he was a heretic. Um, and I'm on their side, but that's another story. The World Council of Churches, well, we don't pay any attention to them anymore. There was a time when they were uh, fairly significant, but they have virtually run their race. The General Senate, now our constitution of our church here is set up in this way. The General Senate meets, but nothing it decides means anything until each individual diocesan synod accepts it. So, for example, a prayer book for Australia, a green book we used to use, we don't anymore, um, General Synod produced it, said this is the new prayer book for the Anglican Church in Australia. The Sydney Synod said we don't accept it. And so it's not legal in Sydney. Okay, so nothing that the General Synod decides is of any importance to us unless our Synod says yes to it. And their own Synod, well, it's, um, it makes all sorts of rules and regulations and um, some of them, because they are legal things we have to do, most of them we just ignore. And the reason for that is membership. It can be chosen or it can be elected. So, in other words, our city is made up not of the best people, but um, every rector goes to Senate. Um, as a locum here for two years, I didn't get to go to Senate because I was a locum, not a rector. And Senate is very strictly determined by clergy and laity. So as a clergyman, I can't go as a lay person. Mm -hmm. And so you get an interesting mixture of people. Um, there's a lot of politics involved. Uh, uh, well, there was a little bit of concern at the last Anglican Synod here in Newcastle Diocese that somebody put out a how to vote ticket. And uh, um, people said, oh, it's not the right thing. That's been going on in Sydney for years. Uh, I was on the Anglican Church League, we used to meet before Synod and we'd go through and nominate people and we'd sign every second page that came past us so, so that we would recommend it. They always got elected because um, we've got good evangelical biblical people on. And there is persuasion, you know, it's possible to listen to a Synod debate, for example, uh, of someone who is a really good speaker and be persuaded that it's right. Um, and I can remember in Sydney Centre, we had two clergy way back in the old days, Broughton Knox and uh, Johnson from Beecroft, I forget his first name. And they were both canon lawyers, they knew church law inside out and back to front. And so there would be a debate, and people would speak passionately for it, and it would pass. And then the next day it would come back for the next reading, and they would stand up and say, well, you realise if you pass that, you negate this law and this law and you negate this ordinance and this ordinance. Um, because people just got carried away. And unfortunately, we don't normally have people with that sort of ability. It's a place that needs the spirit and the word, the article says. I notice our bishop makes a big thing about, you know, done in the, in the spirit. Um, but unfortunately, the spirit and the word go together. 
and it can and it does and it should make decisions necessary for good government in the church. We need good government in the church and that's what Synod does, hopefully. Ministry. We have a threefold board of bishops, priests and deacons. Bishops, the word is episkopos and it means an overseer or a superintendent or an elder used five times in the New Testament, it always just relates to leadership. No such thing as a bishop. The bishop is the leader in the local congregation. Alex is a bishop of one. Full stop. That's the way the Bible uses it. Presbyteros is normally translated as priest. But it's not, it just means elder. 72 times in the New Testament, 57 times it means an elder in the congregation. The other times it means an old man or an old woman. It's got to do with age. Not the way we talk about the priesthood these days. And the deacon, well, someone in uh, serving the ministry. And Philippians 1, 1 and 1 Timothy 3, 10 assume a leadership role. <clears throat> Is there a problem here? No biblical justification for a modern bishop. And a bishop who thinks that he is the head of the church is not biblical. A bishop who thinks he is a servant of the church is biblical. Also consistent with the, with the ordinal. In Acts 27-28, Episcopos and Presbyteros seem interchangeable. Titus 1, you, he's told, Timothy is told to appoint Presbyteros, but then the qualifications are given for an Episcopos. So Paul's not really interested in the difference between Presbyteros and Episcopos. Very important to understand that. So, church government is different in different places. In the Anglican Church, we've, we've kept bishops. Um, probably the best system, I think. The only problem is, you get a dumb bishop, you've got problems. You get a good bishop, oh, that's fantastic. And uh, I've worked under a number of bishop, archbishops in Sydney. Uh, some of them were absolutely fantastic, some of them were not quite so good. But I think it's better than the Presbyterian system where you have a moderator who's elected every three or five years or seven years, depending on the country, um, where he doesn't have any training for the job and uh, he's basically just an administrative job. Um, the Methodist system is somewhat similar, although Methodists in, in America have bishops. Um, Nonconformist, Baptist Congregational um, Brethren, Church of Christ. The local congregation, that's the biblical way, they're an authority unto themselves. And they have no um, external organisation. Now, um, they get into all sorts of strife because of that. That's why I think probably. The Anglican system has the advantage that it's a system that, that's got rules and regulations and when people sort of start to go off the rails they can be brought back in. Whereas if it's the local congregation who, who does all of that, even though that's the biblical way, it, it can lead to problems. And it does lead to problems. It's not lawful for any man to take upon him the office of public preaching or ministering the sacraments in the congregation before he be lawfully called and sent to execute the same. And those we ought to judge lawfully called and sent, which be chosen and called to this work by men who have public authority given unto them in the congregation to call and send ministers into the Lord's vineyard. Okay, basically, you need to be called into ministry. Um, one of the problems that the church has is that there are far too many people who say, I've been called to ministry. And what do you say to them? Uh, what evidence is there of that? 
um, in Sydney Diocese. I had to first of all get letters testimonial from my rector and from uh, the parish council's congregation saying that they thought I was called to ministry. And I had to go and have an interview with Bort Knox, which was the most terrifying experience you could ever have. Um, because he sat there in his leather armchair and he'd say something and he'd say yes and he'd write for five minutes. He's probably right for shock of this, but it didn't matter. And it's interesting, when I was on the college staff with him, he said to me, you know, he said, I was a hopeless interview, I never knew what to ask. I just knew if I shut up, they'd eventually hang themselves. <laughs> I thought, yeah, what a, what a good principle. Um, but you need to be cool. It's why, uh, and I, I have to say, all my criticisms, the, the bishop recently wrote to clergy saying, could you sort of find people and, and, and tell them that they are called to the ministry? Uh, when, I, when I left Mount Druitt, there was a young man there in the fellowship who was who just finished his law degree. And the, uh, the fellowship came down to visit the Port Kimber where I was as the curate. And I remember saying to Bruce, let's go for a walk. And he walked around the block and I said, Bruce, I know you just finished your law degree, but I think you would have been in ministry. And uh, he took it seriously and he did go into ministry and a brilliant uh, ministry retired now, of course, because we're all old. You've got to be called. And that's important. Um, bishop Greg, the previous bishop of Newcastle, when I went to be interviewed by him, he said to me, one of the problems I have is that um, nowadays people go and do a theology course from Melbourne Divinity College in which I have no input. And then they present themselves to me and say, I've got a theology, theology degree, can you ordain me? And he said, I've had no input into their, into their training or anything. And that's, that's hopeless. Um, so you need to be called and authorised, and I think that's important because otherwise you end up with all sorts of duels in the pulpit. In the New Testament, there is no hierarchical order. The ministry is seen as servanthood. There's no such thing as clergy and laity, just different functions. There's no mediatorial priesthood. The priesthood doesn't um, have any special power. So there is no difference in God's sight between Alex and you. There's a different function. He's been set aside to work full time to manage the congregation. But he's no more important than you are in God's plan of things. Key principle is calling. Ordination is simply a recognition of gifts for ministry, a setting apart of a person for service. It is not a sacrament. It is not therefore binding. People can quit the ministry. People can be removed from the ministry when they do the wrong thing. And that's all it is. Now I've got to hurry because on Wednesday we didn't even get to the sacraments. I'm going to try and get to them, John. The means of grace, the word, the medium through which God makes himself known. Preaching of the word is the means God usually uses to produce conviction of sin, saving faith and sanctification. I've talked about that and also private and group reading to aid what happens in church is important. Worship. It's praise and honour and thanks to God. It's important because it is best done in community. All right, I can sit at home and watch the cricket and I see every intricate detail and they play it five times and I can watch a football match and I get close-ups of what's going on and then when there's something controversial they play it five times. But it's not the same as being at the ground. The atmosphere is just so important. And so it is with church. Not via TV or online unless that's necessary because of health and so on, it should be here with the people of God. Um, the Church of Scotland decided that after COVID, uh, so many people were so, were so used to getting their services online that they could afford to close churches. Rubbish! You've got to get people together. 
That's the important thing. How do you worship? The New Testament has no liturgy. The church developed liturgy. The Anglican liturgy is biblical, but it has its problems. Still better than the hymn sandwich. You know, a hymn, a prayer, a hymn, a Bible reading, a hymn, a, prayer, a sermon, a hymn, a couple more prayers, and a hymn. That's a hymn sandwich. And uh, yeah, it's, got some, it's got some parts of it, but the Anglican liturgy is, is so much superior to that. And more free-flowing liturgies depend on the skill of the leader. Yeah, they just say, do your own thing. And I always come back to uh, C.H. Spurgeon, one of the greats, who, who built this huge metropolitan tabernacle in, in London and filled it, you know, three, three galleries, filled it every Sunday for a number of services. When he died, the church was empty and it burnt down eventually because nobody was using it because it was all based on the personality of him and he was brilliant. Now, you need a church which can survive even when the guy out the front isn't necessarily brilliant, isn't necessarily charismatic. Um, must be able to be understood, that's the principle of the prayer book, should be honouring to God. Music was lost for centuries, but we've now got it back. But it must honour God. A lot of the stuff we sing does not honour God. Uh, it doesn't honour God if, for, if you can't sing it. A lot of the modern stuff, ordinary people can't sing. It doesn't honour God if the words are rubbish. In the end, however, whatever matters most is your attitude. Sacraments ordained of Christ to be not only banished or tokens of Christian men's profession, but rather they be certain sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace and God's goodwill towards us. Uh, there are two sacraments ordained of Christ our Lord in, in the Gospel, that is to say, baptism and the supper of the Lord. I think I've printed the 39 articles in your paper, have I? So you've got mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. yeah, so mm -hmm. um, okay. I did my years at college with the great theologian Brought Knox as my teacher. I never understood sacraments. I thought, why are they so important? I can, I can sit around the table at home and remember the death of Jesus. And one day, uh, sitting in my office at Moore College, the principal, Peter Jensen, rang and said, I'm sick. I'm supposed to be lecturing in the evening course tonight. You have to do it. Sure, Peter, not a problem. What's the topic? Sacraments. <laughs> so what do you do when you're a historian? You actually look at the history of the sacraments and you hope that at the end of the hour you haven't got up to the point where you have to actually explain them. You know, <laughs> you finish. And I was reading Cranmer and he said the sacraments are doing this in community. In other words, the thing that makes them so effective is that we do them together. I ran down, Broad Knox was retired, but he's back doing some lecture, and ran down, knocked on his door, said, Broad, what about this? I've hey, never seen that before. You must write an article on it, that's good. I never did, but it uh, doesn't matter. Um, it's a community thing. It's why I will not do a baptism except in a church service. The thing that makes it meaningful is it's an entry into the congregation. So these baptisms at three o'clock Sunday afternoon, not on. Why do it? Now there are a whole lot of other things in that. The other things that are not sacraments, confirmation, penance, orders, matrimony and extreme unction are not sacraments. Um, that's because they uh, were abuses that had grown up in the medieval times and uh, it's based on the idea that we have um, direct access to God. They're symbols, they're badges, tokens, our profession of faith of God's work in us. We don't need an intermediary, that's the important thing. Only two. How do they work? Communication is vital. The attitude of the recipient is vital. The minister is irrelevant. Article 27. 
right? If he's a drunken sod and womanizer and all that, doesn't mean the sacrament is ineffectual because it's all based on you and your attitude. Well, baptism, um, let me just say, it's a sign of a difference. It's a sign of regeneration, of new birth, repentance. Children's baptism is to be retained, the article says. It's based on covenant promises. The Old Testament says, I will be your God and you will be my people and I am your God unto the third and the fourth generations of those who love me. So baptism is claiming a promise <coughs> my faith will mean God's blessing. But again, because it's personal, the parents who answer for the child, if they have no faith, it's meaningless. So in preparation, I say to the parents, it's not going to have any meaning unless you have your own personal faith. And then, of course, the child has to confirm it. Um, that adult baptism is obvious, can be a way of strengthening faith, can be a, a powerful witness. In the Lord's Supper, um, let's look at that. Um, it's a sign of love to one another and a sign of a right relationship with Christ. In the old days of the Book of Common Prayer, uh, the start of the community service, there were rubrics Grab an old book of common prayer and read them. They are brilliant. They're, they're old fashioned, but they're brilliant. You know, if you are an evil liver, you can't take communion. If you're um, at odds with anybody in the congregation, you can't take communion. And the curate had to go around and actually say, you can't take communion. Because the week before you gave an indication you were going to come to communion next week, because it only happens three or four times a year. So the, the curate came and said, no, no, you can't do it. Um, so what right you were dealing with faith received? Transubstantiation is a heresy. Let's get that clear. 39 articles say it, and we've already talked about it. It's a heresy. The bread remains bread and the wine remains wine. They are set aside for us as special because we use them to remember what Christ did, but they do not change. It's to be taken in a heavenly and spiritual manner and you can't reserve it or adore it. You can't reserve it, which means you can't take it around you know, next week. You can't adore it. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. But I, when, I was, when, I was cure, when I was catechist at Darling Point, student minister at Darling Point, I was actually reading the first part of the communion service and, and Archbishop Frank Woods from Melbourne was, was doing the communion bit. So I'm at the table. And he consecrates the bread and the wine, and then he falls flat on the floor. And I immediate, my immediate reaction was, the guy's had a heart attack, what do I do? But of course, he thought, oh, that, that was Jesus up there, so he was worshipping it. Yeah, um, it threw me when it first happened, it really did. Now I was going to talk about, uh, well, it's one stage, I was going to talk about buildings, parochial system, rules and regulations. I won't do that because we've run out of time. All you need to remember is that the New Testament says the church is the local congregation. Everything else has developed since the New Testament. And nothing is to be accepted that is not consistent with the scripture. Full stop. And beyond that, everybody's free to do church in their own way. As long as it's consistent with the scripture.